today we're here we're going to talk about uh, teaching ratios using the CSA model but mostly with today what we're wanting to talk about is how to teach ratios to special needs students and those students who have disabilities that's really important for our kids to know this especially that sixth seventh and eighth grade group and we don't want to hinder them just because they don't understand um, multiplication or fractions and that's a big part of the ratio so let's talk about how we can get through that for our agenda for today is what is a ratio of course uh, using the CSA model uh, manipulatives that we're going to use and I want to use manipulatives today that you would have in your classroom but also manipulatives so you can teach this at home and uh, many of our kids are going to need multiple exposures to, to this so I want them to have some kind of manipulative they can touch at home and then how to use those manipulatives specifically and then moving to the abstract what happens when we do move to the abstract and what we can how we can go back and forth between those and then virtual manipulatives that you can also send um, to your kids that they may be able to use that are free because I don't want them using something that's not free and then of course there's going to be some resources at the end let's start with what is a, manu uh, a ratio so if I'm talking about a ratio I'm talking about the relationship between two amounts uh, that are showing the number of times one value contains or contained within another value and you're going to look at two numbers and you're going to compare them and the comparison of the size may be of one number to the size of another those kind of things and the way that ratios are written some of our kids get confused about this because we tend to not think about our language when we're teaching fractions and we say out of we don't want to say out of like one out of three that's not true it's one, two, three in this case. That's how we're going to read this. And so if I do a colon, it's the same way. I'm saying one, two, three. So in this case, it's one bird to every three uh, dogs in the yard. There's one bird to every three dogs in the yard. Uh, or one third. So one third of the animals are birds. So keep that in mind that when we're talking to our students and we're showing them, we want them to know ratios in all three forms, as a fraction, with the colon, and then with the word two. So that's important. Now, in our vocabulary for ratios, there's several things that we're gonna talk about today, but we're gonna save some for the next time that we do this because I don't want to go over uh, proportions yet because some of our kids probably aren't ready for it and we need to not skip how important ratios really are. So, like I said, a ratio is in comparison of two numbers. And then we may get into rate. Rate is, a compa is comparing two numbers measured in different units. Now that's really hard for our kids to make sure that the units are the same. And we're gonna use some things for SDI to correct that. And then of course there's unit rate and that's the rate of one unit is, get, uh, is given for the quantity. And you're going to think about that. So rate is one unit of a given quantity. So, and then unit price, and that's the price per one item or an item. And so we want to look at all of those things. The other thing that we're, like I said, we're not going to talk about proportions today, and I'm not going to talk about proportional reasoning, but that's in the vocabulary for ratios. But a big thing is the scaling factor. Now for our kids, they don't see a lot of uh, maps these days, but scaling factor is so important. And to scale down or to scale up, whichever way they're doing, sometimes they don't realize it, that this is a multipl multiplicative factor, not an addition factor. So keep that in mind that if they're doing the sc scale drawings, they're enlarging them or they're reducing them, whichever way it may be, that if they're scaling up or they're scaling down, what they need to do and talk to them about what's happening to the size of it. That's not really changing the, if it's a map, it's not changing the distance, even though they're changing the size of the scale. And then yep. just scale factors, scale factors in general, it's just the relationship uh, between corresponding sides of similar. And this is big, a big thing for kids when we get into those triangles and, and different size for geometric shapes. So keep that in mind too. And that's going to, go right on for later on when they get into geometry. So like I said, those are important things that we need to re remember. Um, our next thing that we're gonna talk about, like I said, is the CSA model. Now, we want to use the CSA model from kindergarten through 12th grade. Kids need to have their hands on the manipulatives. They need to make sure they can 
demonstrate it somehow through concrete and then move on to the semi-concrete and then on to the abstract or actually do them coherently together as they're as they're working so if you think about it maybe i'm doing concrete but i'm also drawing what I'm, I'm actually building so they want to do that so the concrete model of course is manipulatives there's a lot of different manipulatives we're going to talk about today then the semi-concrete is when i can draw that same image or i can draw the image that's being stuck in my head at this point because i've worked with it so often and then the abstract is basically when i move on to just the symbol now if i'm doing concrete most kids only need three times of doing concrete but unlike our special needs students now those kids 10 20 you may go think you're ready go up to the semi-concrete if we've had a break we're going to move right back to the concrete again and we're going to build these together so at their pace as they need you're going to continue with these and sometimes you think oh they're using those as a crutch but they're not they will let go of those so keep that in mind and then of course as we're doing these they're going to be seeing the abstract because you're going to be showing the abstract as a problem most of the time you're going to actually give them the problem you're going to work it out they'll see the abstract they may not be building it they not, may not be writing it as they're building it but you're going to probably be doing that so keep that in mind too um manipulatives that we want you to use or you can use counters of course is one of them quiznary rods and most people don't think about those they think about them just for multiplication or they think about them just for fractions but truthfully they're used for ratios too um of course any kind of colored objects any type of colored objects that you have that can do comparisons that's a great way and we're going to talk about that today because you may have multiple ones of those at home legos i like legos for several reasons one legos can be used as numbers and legos can be used as colors so we've got both of those and then unifix cubes and i know there are tons of unifix cubes laying around schools that's not being used beads and so we're going to use all of those today and i'm going to talk about those so we're going to get started with that i'm going to change my sharing of my screen a little bit and i'm going to just start with if we we're talking to our kids those manipulatives i said color manipulatives that you may want to use got one little robot there so one yellow robot to every two green robots and so if i was going to show those to my kids and i was going to have them that of course that's my concrete and then if i wanted to talk about my semi-concrete i could do just a circle one robot and he could be a yellow one i put a yellow in there to the green which they're drawing and then i can change this over to one to two one to two or one to two so i want to do that for our kids i want them to see all three if we can they may just be asking to build them those kind of things so that's how i would use this i've got wiki sticks here because i like to use wiki sticks for those kids who need it some more of that sdi if they need it so that they can put things in they have trouble with moving stuff if they need that, just an organizer that's a good thing so that they can just bump up against that as you can see so wiki sticks are good for that but of course i can just draw lines on the paper it's not going to change anything um, if that child doesn't need that but i like these because one they're kind of good size my kids can grab them they can move them around they can stand them up if they needed to to do that another thing that we can use is i said beads but i can use glass beads if i needed to so these are very cheap Found them at the dollar store. So one green to every two blue. So these are just those little glass beads. Like I said, you find at the dollar store. Um, that you can have. We can look at. I found these. These are just some kind of little building blocks that we had. For the kids. So one yellow to two or one yellow to three like i said if i'm going to do that i'm also going to show it so there's that one to three and then i could go over here and write 
okay, one third, one, two, three, or one colon three. Now we're going to get into talking about this in a little bit about with a word problem that they may have, they may use. But I just wanted you to see some of the manipulatives that we've got. Okay, so one thing that we can use for ratios is clothespins. And I like to use clothespins, especially if they've got like dots on them or if they're colored, which is another good way to do that. And I've got some really pretty ones here. I've got some reds and some blues as you as you can see um so i really like that these are different ones that i can use so if i was using just the colored ones i could say a good example and i like these for uh kids who have motor issues one they're bigger number two if they need to work on that pincher grass then you can use these so that's important so if i have one red for every two blue and i can actually if I wanted to, I could hang these on each other so they could see two of them was down here. So you could see this right here where it's one to two, or it could be one to two. And then there's a division for our students where they're doing that. And if we were doing a division, we'd probably want to do it farther over. And then let's say, okay, so if I've got two, if they're for every one red, I have two blue what's going to happen if i have three red how many blue should i have and so i'm going to go ahead and put these this way now like i said before and depending on the student if they're vertical or horizontal how they may want to do this but they know there's two for every one so at this point we can start talking to that student about okay so for this one how many do i need just like for this one i needed two so I can line these up this way and my second one would touch this the first one so there's that too and then again i'm going to need two so i'm going to put these two on here and so another two for this one and like i said if they need to they can line them up to where there's two down here and you have to count them that away maybe a little harder for kids but they can do that now in this case we know it's one to two but what would it be if i had three and so this is getting into kind of that proportion but yet we're talking about what's going to happen with the ratio so for three i would have one two three four five six and so my students can see that they can see that for these three i would have six and that's important that they know that and that they can write that so this is a good way to start to show ratios and i'll start i'll show you this a little bit later with legos too but i really like this as an opportunity for our students if they need larger items if they need to work on their pincher grasp and this is a way to do that without having to worry about it just being an ot skill i'm actually blending it in now before you heard me talk about if it had if you had just the plain ones you could put dots on it so and that's pretty well that's cheap and easy to do so if you don't have colors what can i use well i can actually have a visual so for every one and you can see my my dot for every one i would have two and so now you can see my two dots down here so if i had one two three down here i would need again two four six and they can see that so this is just another way to start showing those equivalent ratios another thing that we can use like I said before, it's just regular beads, and I'm just going to lay those in there. So these are white beads. I've got some yellow beads here. I'd have two comparisons for them, and they can see that. Unifix cubes, the same way with unifix cubes. Um, in this case, if I wanted to build one to three now, I want to use black for my one. 
but I'm building one to three. So that's how I'm going to use just a couple of my manipulatives. Now, this is going to fall right over into working with a number line. And if you don't think you have a number line at home, you probably do. It's just not in the form you're thinking. A ruler. So talk to your parents about, do you have a ruler at home? And if you do, like this one right here, this is just for, uh, if you're using a, well, this is a dressmaker's one, but like I said, you've got a perfect ruler here. You've got the one. Now, if we're using clothespins, the red's going to go on the ones. So it'll go on the one up at the top. And I want to put the green on the bottom in this case. So if I was doing one to three, I can start to see this. It's going to go over every three. This one's just, if the red is just going on the ones, look at here, the red's going on one, two. Now I got to count over three and put the next one. So two would be two, two, six. So I can start to see that. And then three three reds, counting over three more, and they would put down the nine. So you can see how they could do that one. So they can look at that number line. I can use it with jumps. So if I've got a number line and I'm talking about jumps and that child's got a number line up here. No, oh, can't see that. Let me move it down. Um, so if I've got one, two, three, four, Five, six, seven, eight. I'm gonna put these here. So if my red was here, I'm just gonna put an R. And then my green was here. This is my first jump. I'm gonna start at zero, making my jump, making my jump. Now my next jump here is gonna to be to two, and next jump here is gonna to be to six. So they'll start seeing that two on the number one. And that's what I want them to do. I want them to start seeing where how is this growing? How is it being exponentially shown for them? Not exponentially because that would be much larger, but what happens if I got two? What happens if I got three? What happens if I got four? So seeing that multiplicative factor. Now, let's just work through a couple of problems because that's what I want to do is just work, we'll work through just a few problems. So um, on this one, it says at the burger shop, the ratio of regular sodas uh, sold to diet sodas was three to six. So how could I do that? How could I build that if I was talking about that? Anybody want to talk to me about how you'd want to build it? So if I'm going to build my sodas of three to six, I'm trying to erase that and it's not working. I'm going to say, okay, so my regular sodas are black. Here, black cubes. I turned them upside down. Turn back over. The black cubes. Now this can kind of get into a fair share thing too in just a minute so that we can break it down to what does one soda look like. If I went back to just one, if I just sold one regular soda. So if we're looking at this, This is three to six. I have three regular sodas, two diet sodas. Now, I can do a fair share real quick. This one gets two. This one gets two. So this one gets two. So for every one regular soda I sell, I have two. So my actual ratio, not if I needed to reduce it or simplify it in this case, it's gonna be one to two. We don't wanna say reduce because that makes it sound like it's smaller. But if I wanna say that I'm gonna simplify it, then it's gonna be one to two. So looking at that, that's what we want to make sure our kids can see. They're, they're getting that and that they're going to do that. So that's one way that I can show how to do that, that simple problem right there. Now let's do another one just real quick. For every two roosters in the chicken lot, there are five hens. What is the ratio of roosters to hens? So for every two, there is five. Now, what happens if I get four roosters? Let 
So here's for these two, there has to be five, correct? So I wanted to go ahead and look at that. So for these, there's going to be five. And for these, there's going to be five. So for every four, there would be 10. So that's just one way that we could build that. Now, if we needed to break this down for them to see, guess what happens with this one down here? We're going to talk about this. If we do a fair share over here. Let's look at this if we're going back to one. Fair share. And here's a half. So that's what happens with that one. We actually have to cut this one down the middle. And so it's a half. So it'd be two and a half in this case. Okay. At the pet store, the ratio of dogs to cats is four to seven. Now, we know that that's a ratio of four to seven. So they're going to build four on the top for dogs and cats on the bottom is going to be seven. And then we can talk about whether we could do a fair share with that and break it down to where, where if we had one, what would that look like? And then what happens if I had eight dogs. So we can continue to do these very similar things. Um, the one thing about this right here that I want to talk about though is for my kids sometimes I would say there was four dogs to every seven cats and then what would happen would be that the question would ask for cats to dogs. So one of the things that I want you to keep in mind is color coding and that is definitely a way that you can make sure that they know what's happening. And so I would have them to go through the, through as they're reading it and they would color code. So they would color code the four dogs in blue. So four dogs in blue and then they would come down and below it, they would color code the dog in the question as being blue. And then they would go through and they color code the cats and the cats were all in yellow. So cats were yellow, they come down in the answer, yellow. So they knew to put the answer that went with the blue first and then the answer that went with the yellow next. So make sure that you're using maybe some color coding for those kids, just so it's a visual that they can get and, that, and it's just organizing their thoughts because they have trouble going back to look at that problem and seeing what's important in it. So if you can, color code as much as you possibly can for that. Now, this one says during a class election, uh, the ratio of votes for Tiffany to the votes for Jerry was four to three. And so another one that we could build real quick, four to three. We can look at that. And then what happens if she got six? Or what happens if she gets more than that? So, but for right now, if they're just building these four to three, they're building it, they're gonna write it. They already know it is four to three on there. So what's another way that I could write that? Making sure they're writing it with a fraction and those are writing it with the word two, so you continue to do that. Another one, for every five cars in the parking lot, there is six trucks. So we're gonna build that. I wanna do this one with some gems. And they can build these with cars if they needed to, so keep that in mind. Whatever they have at home that's colorful that they could do, then let them. So for every five cars, There is six trucks. We're going to build that, and then of course I'm going to say, okay, now let's write that. How would you set, How would you actually write that? And so of course they're going to start with five to six. They're going to write five the colon six, and then of course five, six. And I want to see all of those. Now, another thing that they're going to do with this is you might want to build it as if they've got 10, if they had 20, and what's going to happen. But for many of our kids, they're not going to know if they've got that right and or be able to check it or understand it. So how is a way that they can under, understand this? And we're going to get into that in just a minute with using a multiplication chart. And so we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. Now, I like this one. 
because everybody, most everybody likes hamburgers. So the ratio of onions to pickles on a burger is two to four. And so for every two of my onions, I'm gonna have four pickles. So what happens if I need to make 10 burgers? This is just one. So what happens if I need to make 10 burgers? That's just one. So how many, how many would I need to have? And so they could build up if they needed to. And we could think about that. Or we can think about if I needed 10 and I know this is two, how many am I going to need of those compared to these? And we can put these down here like this. So this is one. And then they could go up here and they can actually start building out 10 burgers. And that would be one, two, and go across as you can see. So they would keep on actually building these out. And they would put the four down here until they got to 10. The teaching kids to organize is a huge pro problem that we have because they have so much trouble organizing. So making sure that you go back and start showing them how to organize this too, as if I've got two to four in this great little line here, then if that's just one, how many would I have to put up here to get to 10? So start talking to them about how to organize this. And for many of our kids, they may understand that especially your higher UNB kids, they're going to get it right off the bat that this is no problem with that's going to be 20 of those, but how many am I going to need down here? And so they may have to rebuild these and actually write with them. So that's okay. It's perfectly fine for them to be able to do that. So keep that in mind. Um, I think the way that you're having them organize their, their tools there, uh -huh. that's going to lead to them being able to organize once they start drawing and start that next step in the CSA model. Yes, so it is. The way if we if we request them that they organize their tools, then it will help when they organize uh, what they're when they show their thinking and their drawing. Yeah, because if I go from this, and then I want to move to over here to just drawing it, I want to take that off of there. Just a second, move these over. Right, if I'm going to organize my thinking with that, and I want them to actually draw that back out. And so, again, I've got two hamburgers. I mean, I've got two pickles and uh, onions in this case, right? Forgot what I was using. So I've got two onions, and I'm going to go to four pickles. Somebody really likes pickles, is what I was thinking. And so, this is one, two, three four, five, six, seven, wait, I did it wrong, did I? Eight, nine, and 10. And then how many would I need down here? If this is a group of four, this is a group of four, this is a group of four, and, this, and you may have them just draw the circles out. But if they know this already, and they can just go ahead and, and jump to this, this is great, but they may have to draw all those circles and count them because that happens. Right, but our goal is to get them to those symbols, right? Yes, our goal is to make sure that we're to those symbols. So if we go to a group of four, and then at this point they can do, unfortunately I really hate that they do the additive process here because they're just adding because ratios is not additive thinking, it's more of multiplicative thinking, but let's keep in mind that they can go ahead and just add those up if they need to, and they would have 40. But if not, then, you know, they can go ahead and they can, like I said, they've drawn all those little circles out, they can go ahead and count. But the problem is you get into there is when they're counting, sometimes they mess up their counting or they mess up how they are. So you want to make sure that they really do start organizing their thinking as much as possible in this. And like I said, that's just part of that SDI getting that organizing done and making sure that they can do those kind of things. So that's one of the things that we want to make sure that they can do. So let's talk about how you can use Legos to teach ratios. Now it's really important for us to get kids involved. And one of the things I know is that boys love Legos. So we can use Legos because of the numbers and the variety that they have. But I use Legos to also teach skip counting for my students. Um, so this is, like I said, it's, it's very versatile. You can use this for teaching multiplication, uh, many things, but Legos are great. And like I said, it gets kids interested and gets kids involved. So 
let's think about that uh, today. So let's just talk about a couple of problems. I'm going to kind of read those out, and then we will determine, um, first of all, our first one says that, I'm going to go back to the same problem I used earlier, that I have three regular sodas to every six diet sodas. So, and it actually has the ratio written three to six with the colon. So that student's going to have that information already. So we know that this one, and I always talk to my kids that this is regular, and this would be diet. So I have the kids to choose a color of Lego that's going to be regular. And so we could say that we know that the regular is going to be blue. And I go ahead and make a line for them. And so my first one is three. And then my dot is going to be six, which is going to be. So for every three, I have six. Now we can go ahead and write three to six. We can go ahead and write three six. Now, if I talk about this is for one group of people, what would it look like for two groups of people? So if I had two groups of people, this is for one group, what would it look like to have two groups? So if I have two groups of these, I want to have six at this point up here, two groups of three, and down here I'm going to have, what am I going to have down here? Of course I'll have six and six, which would be 12. Now, so this one would be six twelfths, six to twelve, or six and then two twelve. You can see that here. Now, let's look at another problem, of course, uh, real quick. I'll move this out of the way. I'll get my three back over here, my red over here. And we'll look at another problem. Okay. So at another problem that we have for um, that we could look at would be for every five cars in a parking lot, there are six trucks. So for every five cars in a parking lot, there are six trucks. So how can I do five with this? So I'm going to put on here five cars to six trucks so they can start to see. I'm going to use blue for the cars and red for the trucks so we can see those. And for my students, I would probably even have this color coat coded so they would start to see the five in blue and the six in red. So we know that if I draw my line, this is my first one. So I've got six trucks, but how am I going to do five? Well, that's pretty easy. I can just do this little group right here. We can tie them together. That's five. Now, what can I do for two of those? Of course. What does that mean? Five. And then five and for each one there I'm going to have six down here Oop, wrong one. six and six so this one was five to six this one would actually be ten to twelve now like I said, I try to make sure that my kids are writing it every way, so they're going to be doing that down here. And then 5, 6, of course, 10, 12, and 10 to 12. So making sure that they get that. But like I said, these are great. They can be used many ways, many times. Um, I love using these for multiplication and division. It's a great way to do that. Uh, it's really good if they've got the, for the students who need more ability for being able to um, grasp and those kind of things to have the bigger Legos but it, for most of our kids especially our older kids these Legos work wonders and they are the perfect size for them to manipulate and to build on and they can actually build these if they needed to or however they wanted to do do that as long as they were showing the correct representation so this is a great way for us to have those students to manipulate 
to see a ratio. Now let's move on and talk about how can I use um, multiplication chart. So that's the next thing with this is how do I use this multiplication chart? Well, just like with that onions, if we go back to it, let's go back to the onions. I know that I had two. There was two onions, right? For every four pickles. Now I want to go over to the 10. I want to make 10 hamburgers. So I want to go all the way over till I get to 10. So how many pickles would I have? I have 20. And then I want to do the same. I mean, onions would I have? I messed those up again. Onions would I have? I would have 20. And then how many pickles? I would have 40. So my two to four. Or, and then can I reduce that? Because we've talked about can I reduce that? Well, absolutely I can. If I needed to go back, look at here, I'm going to find those on a line. Two to four. I'm going to go all the way back over to one half. So you can start to see all of this in your multiplication chart and teaching those kids how to use that multiplication chart. And it could be as simple as I need to find colors for those kids to do that. I want them to see the different colors and I want them to be able to work through the different colors. So let's think about in the case of in a certain room, there's 12 women and there's nine men. So maybe my student doesn't know where to go for 12 and nine, but I want to go up here and I'm gonna have them to look. I want them to look on each line and I want them to see, do they see a 12 and a nine together? I see a 12 and a nine right here, but it's only going to the nine. So that's not helping me any. So where can I keep on going? So I'm gonna go down here and I'm gonna look and I'm gonna see 12 and I got nine both on there. And then how can I reduce that amount? Well, let's say that I'm not really good with multiplication and division. So how do I reduce that? I can come all the way back over to the beginning and I can see that three and four is the same ratio. It is the, the simplified version of that ratio. So they can start to see that. They can also see that within three to four, I could have 21 and 28 as a ratio for that. They can see that I can have a ratio of 27 and 36. So getting them to understand those ratios for the problem I just gave you, like in a certain room, there are 12 women and nine men. What's that ratio of women to men, or men, in this case, men to women, um, then the ratio would be 27 to 36, or when we reduce it, it's three to four. And I keep on saying reduce, and we shouldn't say reduce, we should say simplify, I'm sorry. So that's how we kind of use a multiplication chart for this, and going through it and making sure that they understand it. Now, let's talk about the Fibonacci sequence. Now, the Fibonacci sequence is a little bit, um, one of those things that's, that's for older kids, but it's really not because there's so many ways for them to be able to see the Fibonacci sequence. And when I talk about the Fibonacci sequence, I'm talking about that wonderful sequence of, you start with zero, one, one, and you're starting to add up. So if you see one plus one is two, and then two plus one is three, and so you keep on seeing that sequence for the Fibonacci rule, and then you keep on going through that. If you go back though, and you do the division, like let's take eight divided by five. Well, eight divided by five is, you can see, can you see this? It's 1.6. Well, let's do another one. Let's do five divided by three. It's the one right before that. If I do that one, it's 1.66. Well, in Fibonacci's world, it's 1.618. And that's the one that we want, that, that is considered the golden ratio. So keep that in mind, it's the golden ratio of, of ratios because it's found everywhere that you can possibly imagine. It's found in patterns in nature, it's found in patterns in art, it's found in geometric shapes, it's found in the human body. You have one body, you have one head, you have two 
outer hose in your head, which are your ears, typically, anyway. Um, you have three, if you look at your face, on, on the front of your face, you have three areas, which is your eyes, your nose, and your mouth. And then you have five holes in your, in your frontal part of your face, which is where your eyes are, your nose, and your mouth. So it's found in the human body, but it's found in multiple places in the human body. So have your kids do a scavenger hunt for some ratios and relate it back to Fibonacci sequence. And that those things are, if you're looking, let's just look at the human body for first. If we're looking at the human body, you can look at the fact of measuring the middle of the arch of your foot to the widest part of their foot. And then they do that division and they'll get it. So they write, the, they write that down. So they do the largest part of their foot to, to the middle part of the arch of the foot, which is the smallest. You do that ratio and if you divide it, you get Fibonacci sequence again. It'll, it'll start showing that one point, so that golden ratio of 1.618. Um, if you do the base of the toe line to the length of the big toe, <coughs> excuse me, you also get this. Uh, the forearm, if you do the forearm uh, to the hand, and then you do the length of the hand, Again, you find that. Um, the length of the face to the width of the face, you get 1.6. It's the greatest thing. Um, if you look at um, another place that, that you may find that is, oh, I love this one. So the length between your eyes to the length between your eyebrows, and unless you have a unibrow, um, you would get that. So, and then the distance between the wrist and the elbow to the distance between the shoulder line. So your shoulder line to the top of your head. So those are all in that sequence. So like I said, it's all over the place for your body. So you can, find so some cool ones that you, you could also do for that um, is the distance, if you're, if you're looking at that, it's the distance between uh, your wrist and your elbow and the distance between your shoulders and the, so the distance between your shoulders and the top of your head, which I thought was really cool. That's a, that's a really great one that you can do. So this, like I said, this Fibonacci sequence, it's everywhere you can find it in flowers. Sunflowers start out with this very center of the sunflower is one, and then you go around it and you start to see that it's actually one. And then there's, there's a little coating that's one and then around that's two and then around that's three and then five and then eight and it just keeps on going. So you'll see that in art, geometric shapes, you're going to find that everywhere you go look at for nature, you'll, you'll see it. Ferns do the same thing, which I thought was great. I, mean, I talked to my daughter uh, earlier about that and she was like, yeah, you, you see it in ferns too. And I was like, okay. So the great places that you will see, see that. Um, Let's talk about misconceptions that you're going to see uh, with our kids. And I'm just going to bring this one to the center. So misconceptions that you're going to see and you're going to note um, with this is, uh, I was hoping that's going to be good. Okay. The students don't realize that ratio of two to eight is the same as one to four. And so going back to using that multiplication chart so that they can do that and they can drag it through, you want to do that. Um, mapping scales that even though you increased you know the scale it doesn't change the distance on the map that you're going to be you know going so keep that in mind um and then of course mistakes that will occur um a good a good example here is if it takes two people so let's say that uh, Doug and I are working and it took us four hours to complete something and then I say well you have to do it by yourself how many hours is it going to take you? Most of the time the kids will say, well, they're just going to go back. They're not going to try to think about that situation. So talk to your kids about the situation in which it's in. If it took me and someone else to do that in four hours, how long is it going to take me to do it by myself? So in this case, oh, one person, it's going to take eight hours. And that's kind of like what happens when kids scale up a map or scale down a map. They get confused on whether they're dividing or if they're multiplying. So keep that in mind. Um, but getting that child familiar with the situation and talking through the situation is really important. And you want those kids to also to look 
at not just the situation of it, but to give them answers sometimes and have them to create a problem from it so that you can talk about those kind of things. Um, another common misconception is, like I said, I've said this entire time, this is not an additive thinking, this is the multiplicative thinking. So you want to make sure that they're doing some multiplicative thinking. Um, and then another issue that sometimes they have is understanding that they need to have equivalent it can't be hours to minutes. Uh, they have to convert and they need to be minutes to minutes. So they'd have to convert an hour over to minutes. Um, they have trouble seeing patterns or generalizing what they see when we use manipulatives compared to when we um, are using just the drawings. So being able to generalize between those and don't make the mistakes I made today and say reduce, say simplified as often as possible. Don't use the words out of, make it a fraction and use those kind of things. Um, some other suggestions you know, I'd give is to make sure that the type of problems are appropriate for the student at the time. Use things that are real world for them. Like I said today, I try to use hamburgers and if we were cooking, how many would it take to do 10 people? Um, so if you're doing a party, there's all kinds of ratios in food because you can do if I'm making one cake compared to three cakes if I'm making um, enough food for uh, if I have to peel four potatoes for four people how many would I have to peel for seven people so getting that understanding um, or maybe I only peel two potatoes for four people and then I how many would I need to peel for seven that's not the case at my house um, so those kind of things is what I want want you to think about when you're doing those kind of things. Now some virtual activities that you can do. If we go back to this virtual activities, this one is a really good one. This is Glencoe's site. I'm hoping it'll come up and I don't know if it will on this. But if not, I'm gonna see if I can highlight it. And I'll bring it. I like this site. Right here it is. Awesome. So this is their site. You can go by grade level. And so you can find different backgrounds if you wanted to on here. There's game boards that they can pick different games and things like that. Uh, there's work mats that you can use from here. They've got different ones on here. Like I said, they've got 10 frames. Carol, you were talking about for your younger ones, this would be really good. Um, but let's go up to like sixth grade. So they've got, if you look at the manipulatives themselves, they have 10 blocks, they have cubes, they have um, connecting cubes. I like their connecting cubes. They have currency, they have number cubes. So you can use number cubes if you want to um, and have them to roll those, make it, make one. And then after and, and make a different one, like if it's two fists, maybe they, they actually create two fists. Um, I'm gonna go back down to the kindergarten one because in the kindergarten manipulatives, they have counters, which I really like. Um, or we can do colored tiles in this case. So if I'm building that and I wanted to say it was one, one half, they can build one half of the colored tiles and they can see that. So that's one of the sites that you can go to. Let's go back to the website and look at the other one I wanted to show you. Uh, let's just minimize this one. The other one is Didax. Didax has some, a lot of great things for their manipulatives. Like I said, I'm going to put this out there for later. So, where did Didax go? I don't know why that did that. So .x, if you look at their stuff, let me just slide this back. They've got these free virtual manipulatives and you can download a bunch of those if you want to um, on their site. But if you go to .x, let me enlarge this. But if you go to .x and you go over to, I've got all my people in my way here. Um, you go to math, 
I think that's where it was at. Quanta, did I change that? I'm not sure. I've not been on there in a while. I know it's on here. I just looked at it the other day. Virtual and weekly news. I can spell. So here's their virtual manipulatives. And so you can pick any of these that you want, two-sided counters, if that's what you want it to do. You can pull your two-sided counters off and you can use those. So if it's two to one, they can build two to one. You can see these. So I really like that. Uh, this side, there's also on here, I'm just gonna go through it real quick. There's a great number line, so you can do the jumps on the number line, like show those. Uh, the base 10 blocks are there, a number board. You could use two colored counters on the number boards. This one's all the way up to 120. That would be really good. Or just lay, uh, if you've got Unifix cubes, you could just lay the Unifix cubes over top of it. Um, so those kind of things. Uh, prime factoring blocks are on there, algebra blocks. Great tools for kids. And so you can send this one home for them. That's another one. And then the last one I think I had on there. Let me go back. Try to make this small here. Uh, of course, is the National Library of Virtual Manipulatives, and they've got a lot of stuff too. And like I said, you can go in there and you can hunt by number and operations. There's all kinds, and they've even got games too. So keep that in mind. This one's a big one. So those are the three big ones that I would suggest for anybody to use. Um, and of course, this right here, helping students, this is another one I put on there with ratios and proportions to understand. I just put that up there. It's a great read as you go through. It's got all the misconceptions that you could possibly find in there and then those kind of things. So I'll put that on here. I'm gonna send this out to everybody so that they can have it. And I'll send out the PowerPoint. I'm also going to put it on the uh, holler. But another thing that I wanted to make sure that you guys seen today was I'm going to go back to this. If you have Quisnery rods in your classroom, because they are so valuable, and I did not use those before, but I want to show you how to use these Quisnery rods. So if I'm working Quisnery rods, the great thing about them, and I'm just going to use this right here real quick is they're already kind of labeled that I, you don't have to worry about it because like I said, they're labeled already. Um, and the kids will figure it out. But in this case, this little block here represents one and the red here represents two. So the students can already see that. I don't know if you can see that red real well or not, but the red represents two. And then if the students are going to do two, so they put two here for the next one. And if they do that, then this is going to represent two, four. And they can start to see that. See how easy this is if you've got Quisnery rods to start to build ra ratios? And so the next one would be, I love these for that reason. The next one, you would just look at it and you would go, okay, if I'm doing three, where would that be? And so they're gonna put two, four, and six. And the reason why that red represents a two is because if I lay these down side by side, see how it's perfectly line for that. Now, if I wanted to do another one, and let's say that I needed it to represent another number, they can come out here and they can, if they need to, because some of our kids will, they can actually lay these blocks down the side of them and say, okay, how many is that? And they can do that if they need to, and they may not know what the blue one is at first. Now, I had one specific set in my room that I had put numbers on because my kids did not know what these represented. So it helped them to, but I only had one set that way because I didn't want to ruin the sets for other things for my kids. 
and I wanted to make sure that they could do that. So they can actually line these up and they can be like, okay, this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And so they can start to see that this blue one, which it's really hard for you guys to see. I've got a lot on it, but it's not helping. The blue represents nine. And so if they needed to, it could be one to nine. And then two to 18. And so they could see, they could see that could be two to 18. And the kids could start to see that and build on that. So I really like Quiznery rods for the classroom. If you've got them, please use them for this. The kids can start to build these and start to see the ratios and it's really, really good for them. So keep that in mind too when you're doing this. Now, uh, I think I've kept you guys probably longer than you thought I would. So, but today we're going to, I got one more video or one more thing I need to show you guys and that's our, and I've lost it. And that's our resources. So for KVEC right now, for special ed groups uh, weekly, uh, we're gonna have an FMD uh, network. I think Cheryl's running that uh, and maybe Brenda. And then we're also gonna have a weekly related service network that Cheryl and Brenda's running. Uh, am I correct about that, Doug? Doug's not paying. yes, he's shaking his head, okay. And then- uh, uh, I think so, I'm not sure. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Steph, I, I joined in a little bit late. Oh, okay. And then, of course, we're having a weekly parent educator uh, network. It's focusing on behavior, and Doug and Cheryl are going to be doing that one. And then, of course, the weekly academic and behavior ones that are going on. Our next one is uh, Chastity. Is that right? Yeah, I'm going to be next Thursday, and I'm going to be talking about um, especially deciding design instruction and reading and what that would look like virtually too as well try to give you some tidbits on how to help your kids during this time right now mainly so yeah and then of course we've got uh the COVID-19 at the holler and then the COVID um KY dose support page and then we've got the the Kentucky Academic Behavioral Response Interventions and if you need some hours there's on that COVID-19 page we also have our um, Spring Institute up. So that's a really good thing if you haven't got a chance to look at those. Uh, those are all available. But uh, I hope you guys enjoyed today's session. Stephanie, I want to remind you to uh, please go back to that very first slide because we didn't get anyone signed in other than uh -huh. myself and you and Carol. I okay, guys. You in. If you can, do it rather please sign in so we have uh, access to everybody and you can see everybody. Again, all you have to do is just hold your, if you have an iPhone, just open up the camera and hover over that um, QR code and you'll get a little drop down from the top. You just click on that mm -hmm. and fill that out for us, please. Mm -hmm. Guys, Thanks. thank you so much for joining us today. I greatly appreciate you guys.